A more diverse community and workforce is inevitable in many global cities. Singapore is no exception. Being a small city, we must compete even harder to ensure our place in the world. To stay competitive, we do need to complement the Singaporean workforce with immigrants who can contribute to our society. In fact, if we think about it, all of us are immigrants. And I think we have all contributed to building Singapore to what it is today. But I understand why Singaporeans are uncomfortable with the large number of foreigners in our midst. They're anxious about jobs, discrimination in the workplace, social habits, and overcrowding. The government is aware of this dilemma and has sought to strike a balance by slowing down the inflow of foreign workers in a measured way. As a result, certain sectors are actually experiencing a tight labour market and skills shortage. Many people are also concerned about the impact on social cohesion and our national identity. Be discussing issues regarding the growing foreign workforce in Singapore oh, okay. and how their numbers impact our society and economy. And we will also discuss how we can all work together to ensure that Singapore remains a good home for everybody. Uh, I think every one of us have to chip in and see what we can do. Yeah, I think so. Come. Um, sure. Minister, in recent years, there's been a significant increase in number of foreigners working and living in Singapore. Do we really need so many? And is it all about economic growth? The economic growth is important because without decent level of growth, there'll be a lot of things that we won't be able to do, providing infrastructure, like HDB flats, hospitals, provisions for the many things that we do take for granted today. So having good economic growth would require a number of things. Foreign manpower plays an important part. So the question is, how much is enough? Is it too many? What we're trying to do now is to make sure that we tighten our rate of growth of foreign manpower, but at the same time tracking our economic growth to make sure that it remains healthy. And it's really trying to balance these two needs. So you ask me whether there's too many foreigners that are here. I would say that let's keep it to be about a third or so, and just to keep track of some of the key data, such as unemployment, wages, and so on. But the foreign workforce has always been part of our economy. The question is, how do you sustain a number that we can be comfortable with? And I fully recognise the discomfort that Singaporeans have shown. So we need to make sure the infrastructure is sufficient, at the same time manage that pace of that growth. There was a friend of mine, he runs a 250 million US turnover a year company here. He was going to expand. At the end, he couldn't get enough workers, he stopped. And he's investing in a nearby country here. Mm. And my worry is that if that branch takes off, the whole business might just shift there. That can happen. Some companies are moving out because they can't have that growth, they can't meet the quota, they can't recruit enough Singaporeans for them to expand their manpower. We are tracking that closely. You need to just keep that level of growth healthy. We're not even talking about phenomenal 5-6%, we're talking about 2-3% growth, so that at least it, it remains at a level where we're dynamic enough. And a big part of it is also managing that growth of the manpower so that it's something that we can stomach and we can adjust to. When your shops go, not only do I lose the jobs that you were creating for our people, there were companies that were supporting your business as well. Mm -hmm. And it kind of affected them. Yeah. That's, so there's a whole that's, ripple effect. There's a whole ripple yeah. effect. I get this sense that you know, they're, they're, people are complaining the economy is overheated, you know, it's moving too fast, I want to slow down, I want to relax. Why I'm paranoid is this. Financial crises around the world, bad things, always happen unexpectedly and we have no way of predicting what will happen. Our economy has slowed down to 1%, 2% now, 3%. All right? And if any of these bad things were to happen, we are going to have a dip again. And yet, I think the majority of people are still talking as though we can afford to be choosy. Of course, we should demand for balance, work life. Get real, the, the world is changing. I mean, fundamentally, the economy is shifting. So here, quite a fair bit of complacency here. In 97, 
Asian financial crisis. Turn of the century, you had the dot-com bubble burst. 911 happened. And you had SARS. And in a space of, what, six, seven years, we possibly had the most volatility that hit us from an economic perspective compared to, I think, many years of history. And it, it was intense. If there are opportunities that come by, grab it. If there's growth, take it. Because it's not a given that economic growth will happen. I can choose to opt and have a slower pace of life, let's enjoy things, not work so hard, prepare to earn a bit less. But can you make that decision as a country to say, let's all smell the roses? If we take that approach, many of us will be smelling the roses because we may not have jobs. <laughs> so that was the backdrop. We explored opportunities for growth. Uh, companies responded. There were opportunities. They wanted more manpower. We opened up. It was during that period where we searched we managed to put the economy on a fairly strong basis. Actually, 08 financial crisis, we recovered quickly compared to actually many other countries. But you're right, we cannot take for granted. If we think big, and being big hearted, people flow in, people flow out, but everyone flows out with a positive impression of Singapore. I mean, that's incredible. You know how many people, how many lobangs we have around the world for us to take advantage of in terms of opportunities? I think it's quite phenomenal. The constraint here is in the bottleneck for growth for our industry is really in the lack of Singaporeans. You know, it's not so much an because add you volume. don't have the numbers, or they are not prepared to take up the jobs, or what is it? I'll give you a good example. We did two ads in the Straits Times recently, and we did a few online ads. Professional point. jobs? Well, these are all frontline service jobs: chefs, waiters, managerial positions, and our company certainly pays above average, a thousand eight. I asked my um, HR managers how many uh, responses we got. She said, "Well, we had about." Uh, two, three hundred applicants, three quarters of which were Filipino, even though our ad says Singaporeans only, mm. right? Because we know we don't have the quota. The fact here is you had maybe 30 or 40 Singaporeans, half of which didn't turn up for the interview. Oh. And I think from that exercise, which cost us probably about 10 to 12,000, we recruited maybe four Singaporeans. So, you know, it just gives you a, an idea of how difficult it is to recruit Singaporeans. So really, the bottleneck for that is not so much whether or not we get more foreign workers. We just, we just can't get Singaporeans. And given the quota system in place in Singapore, if you don't get Singaporeans, you don't get anyone, period. For you to expect a Singaporean to come in to work for 1,800, look at his commitments, his family commitments, so forth, after all the deduction, his take-home salary will only one four one three. Granted, so I think yeah. when you're looking at Singaporeans, first thing, we have to look at their salary. You cannot pack the salary to a foreign selling one eight. One of the big issues we face is salary is being compressed because of cheap foreign workers. To label all of it as cheap foreign labour is, is not quite accurate because when you hire a foreigner, nowadays especially the levies are really high. You also have to buy you know, security bond, you have to pay for their medical and this and that. So to hire a foreigner to do that particular job, whether it's a chef, whether it's front of house, is not cheap. It's not actually, it's, it's not costing us 1008 for instance. It costs more than Singapore. Oh. Yeah. What I'm trying to say is the cheap labour force coming in is actually compressing the wage. If I may add, you are not able to bring in anyone on S pass uh, below a certain wage level. We also look at qualifications. We look at experience. Age will be one proxy. Then if you're going to bring someone in on S pass, apart from the quota that you need to fulfill, uh, you also need to have a higher level of wages. Same for employment pass. There's also a, a tiered system where we expect at least a minimum amount of salary. Exactly for the reasons you cited, we don't want foreigners themselves to be depressing their wages. As Michelle pointed out, it's actually also not cheap which is why companies should have a strong local core because it makes a lot more sense. Singaporeans expect speedy service when they go to hospitals. They expect it to be affordable. They expect it to see a Singaporean at the front desk and that person at the front desk wants to be paid you know, a, a good wage. There's a disconnect there because the, the person doesn't want to pay for the service at the level that will support the person sitting behind the desk. And it's the same thing with any part of our industry in Singapore. If you paid your maid a wage that would be if she was a Singaporean, nobody would have maids here. You can't have your cake and eat it. You can't have cheap um, health care and pay all Singaporean staff a very high wage in the healthcare sector. I had two restaurants in Singapore. We started one in 2005, ran it for about five years. Started another one, a uh, dim sum business, ran it for about two years. And you know, during that time, we struggled with all the manpower issues and all that that my friends are struggling with now. And it came to a point where we just had to say, enough's enough. The quota system really didn't work for us. So we couldn't hire enough foreigners because we didn't have the quota to do it. We couldn't get Singaporeans because the businesses were too unhip, you know, uncool, it was so boring, it's too small. 
and they just didn't want to do those jobs. So we moved our businesses to Japan. We closed everything here, opened in Japan, and to be honest, it's been wonderful working with the Japanese. They are motivated, they're committed. Kitchen staff are committed to doing the best that they can. The front of house are happy with their jobs. They just want to do the best. And I've had the same team for five years, which is unusual in a business like this. High turnover, you know, but nope, in Japan is great. We now have three in Japan. And five years in our industry is practically a <laughs> long service award. And, and they're proud. They're proud to be doing this job. They're proud to be doing, you know, serving the customers the best that they can. And, it just wasn't my experience that staff we could get here had that same attitude.